Hello and welcome to the McCaff Safety Training Studios. I'm Mike from the Safety Office and today we are going to be talking a little bit about the newly signed Marine Corps Order 5100.29 Charlie. The old order that this replaced was known as the Marine Corps Safety Program. Now the 29 Charlie, it establishes what we are going to learn as the Marine Corps Safety Management System. Now, MCAF, we are a VPP site, and that's something to be incredibly proud of. Remember, there's only five of those flags when you drive in the front gate. There's only five of those flags throughout the Marine Corps. And so it's extremely elite. It's very difficult to get. And one of the nice things about this, when we say the safety program is changing, what's really nice here at MCAF, we're not going to have to change a whole lot. One of the questions that I get when people check in, if they've been around the Marine Corps for a while, is why our installations or why... Have they never heard of VPP before when they come to the air facility? Well, the biggest reason is VPP is an installations program. It's not for units. It's not for, you know, most of the organizations in the Marine Corps, only the installations. But what the Marine Corps found was the mishap rates and the accidents, um, they really went down. VPP has been known for over 30 years as an extremely effective uh, safety management system. So when we talk about the Marine Corps changing how we do the safety program, luckily here at McCaff, we've already done it. So a lot of things that we're going to have to do is simply maybe learn some new terminology. We're still going to be a VPP site. I don't believe that's ever going to go away. Um, but the rest of the Marine Corps is coming up to where we are. We're not going to have to change a whole lot, but we'll get into that later. This period of instruction, I want to talk about what the Marine Corps has defined as the four pillars. Now, if you remember, VPP has four elements. You should know these. Remember, we boiled them down to four simple words where involve them, find them, fix them, and train them. Those are the four elements of VPP. Now, when we talk about the four pillars, there's a concept in VPP that we still do that's based on the cycle of constant improvement. We're always trying to do better. We're always looking to see where we had some, some shortfalls and we identify those. And believe it or not, that's where our annual goals come from. This is a good time of year because the CO has just established the, the, the 2021 uh, Commanding Officer Safety Goals. And each one of those goals was established specifically because we identified through self-assessment that there were some areas that we could do better in um, and other areas we just needed some minor tweaks so we can continue with some good progress that we've had. That process is called the Plan, Do, Check, Act. If you've taken my OSHA 30 or OSHA 10 hour class, you know we talk about the PDCA, the Plan, Do, Check, Act. This was a dimming, um, uh, you know, a, a dimming process improvement model and OSHA has always said there needs to be some type of plan, do, check, act in our safety management systems. So we're going to take the four elements of VPP and we're going to merge those with the plan, do, check, act. And what you're going to see with the, the, the PDCA and the four elements of VPP, we already do what now the Marine Corps order is expecting the rest of the Marine Corps uh, to come up to our standards. I'm not going to read the entire order to you, but what I do want you to do is I want you to get your workbooks out. Everybody should have just some semblance of some type of workbook. Over time, I'm going to create more of these videos. Uh, the workbooks may change. I, I still haven't quite figured out how we're going to do that yet. Um, but here on the screen, you can see uh, Marine Corps Order 5100.4 Charlie. Uh, this is Volume 1, Chapter 1, and that is what describes what the safety management system, the Marine Corps Safety Management System, is. And in there we talk about, or it, it, it describes, the four pillars. Now you can see up here, the four pillars are policy and leadership, risk management, and yes, that's the risk management that you already know in the Marine Corps, safety assurance, and then safety promotion and training. Now, if you think about the four elements of VPP we've got over here, we've got management, leadership, and employee involve them, uh, or involvement. We've got worksite analysis, hazard prevention and control, and safety and health training. So these aren't that much different. 
So what I want to do just for the next little bit, I want to talk about each one of these. And first, we want to talk about policy and leadership. That is the first pillar. Policy and leadership, when we started down the VPP journey, the very first thing we had to do, it was phase one of VPP implementation. We had to make sure there was a policy. Now, I know everybody doesn't go out and, and grab the local safety policy and read it. But before we could even do anything, OSHA required that the commanding officer had signed a policy that established the framework for how we are going to manage our VPP program. We've got the safety order. We've got policy letters. There's a policy. There's a chapter on how we, uh, how we submit flash reports. There's a policy on how we do near misses. Everything is governed and signed by the individual in the organization that has the authority okay, to direct the people that work there to do a certain thing. This is an easy concept for us to understand in the Marine Corps. Okay? But if you look here, policy and leadership, you can see they do break this pillar down into two sections. Okay, safety policy provides the framework to build a sound and proactive safety program. Active leadership, involvement, okay, does that sound familiar? Management leadership and employee involvement uh, in the implementation and execution of the Marine Corps safety management system at all levels is critical. Now think about it right now, OICs, uh, because we're doing this video uh, in January of 2021, here at McCaff, OICs, they're in the process of authoring their risk mitigation plans. We've got NCOs that are teaching classes, staff NCOs that are, are also teaching classes. We've got the JHAs that are being reviewed. We've got the off-duty risk assessments that we just looked at uh, in the summer and then before we went into the, the winter season. And so we've got all these things that we do and everybody is involved reviewing things. And then we'll put all of this together in the annual risk mitigation plan. And that risk mitigation plan isn't just supposed to, in fact, it's, it's in the CO's cover letter this year, that risk mitigation plan is not to be just stuck on a wall someplace so we get the administrative check in the box. It's supposed to be a living, breathing document, a tool that we use, and then next January, we'll look back at 2021 as we're moving into 2022. We'll see what worked. If it didn't work, we take it out. If it does work, we'll leave it in. Right now, we're looking back, and part of uh, the January review process this year was for everybody to go through and take a look at the document that, that came from the safety office, the, the 2020 trend analysis. That is part of our, 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 our plan, do, check, act. And the plan portion of this is all of these documents. We're planning, and, and the do part would be the execution of those plans. And so you can see the safety policy. It provides the framework, uh, just as the, the, the order says here. Um, describes the organization's expectations, objectives, uh, employee participation, risk tolerance, the business rules, um, the policy corresponds to the plan. I, you know, we already talked about that in the PDCA uh, business cycle is what they call it in the order here. Uh, how each organization implements, promotes, supports, and reinforces those policy is the do in the PDA, uh, PDCA cycle. So in short, all this simply means is we have an order that the CO signs. We have a comprehensive list of, of regulations and instructions, and this governs how we function. And then the senior individual uh, in the unit, which is the commanding officer, signs it, and then that becomes a directive. And so then if you go down just a little bit more in the order, it talks about leadership. And I just want you to listen to what this says. It says commanders, commanding officers, and leaders have overall responsibility for safe operation and must, and must clearly establish safety responsibility and accountability through their organizations, communicating their commitment to the safety and health of our Marine sailors and civilian Marines. Now let's think about that just for a minute because the very first thing in the risk mitigation plan, each OIC's risk mitigation plan, it has a specific place for responsibilities. Who's responsible for the safety and health program in your work center? You need to know that individual and that person is gonna champion the overall MCAF safety program and take it down to the section level. It says safety staffs at all levels shall assist commanders with the implementation and integration of safety and risk management elements into all activities. 
we're going to see here, we're not going to talk about risk management much today. When it talks about all activities here, we're going to find later on in the order, all activities, that includes on and off duty activities. So many of you have had a hand in the off duty recreation activity uh, risk assessment worksheets, those reports that we've, we've put out. Uh, this is exactly what they're talking about. They want us to take the risk management principles that we use on duty and also apply them for the things that we do off duty. It says commander set safety policies and goals and lead the Marine Corps safety management system implementation, communicating safety management throughout the organization by identifying and controlling hazards. Does that sound familiar? We find them. Okay. We do that through the worksite analysis. That's the, you know, the second element of VPP. And, and you can see here worked into the leadership aspect of it. They talk about finding the hazards, finding those things here at the airport that can hurt us during, uh, you know, during our daily tasks, but also finding those controls uh, because it's up to the commander to determine um, just what resources are going to be put towards uh, the hazards. Uh, you know, keep on going again. I'm not going to read this entire order to you. Uh, that should be something hopefully in your workbook. You're following along, uh, you know, and, and you're filling in the blanks. I should be hitting all of those at least. But I want you to take a real quick look. It says commander shall. So these are the things that the CO, by the Commandant of the Marine Corps, the CO is going to be held accountable to these things. Establish a documented safety policy. Now we have that. Okay. It's communicated to all personnel, both military and civilian, making clear that they are required to actively engage in the Marine Corps safety management system. We already do this here at McCaff. So, and this is where everybody's engaged in VPP, all those resources that come out of my office, not necessarily saying everybody has to be involved in everything, but everybody should be involved in something. And this is making it very clear that the commanders have to make sure that everybody is actively engaged in the Marine Corps safety management system. Commanders shall establish and implement processes that facilitate effective participation by all personnel at all levels. So this is saying it's the CO's responsibility to at least establish the policy, but each of us have the responsibility because we've been directed okay, to be actively involved in our safety management system. Look at B there, provide personal leadership and assume overall responsibility. He's the CO, the buck stops with him here. Okay. If we fail, we're failing our leadership. We're failing our OIC. We're failing the department heads. Okay. The CO has taken full responsibility. He's been directed by headquarters Marine Corps. But in our order, it also says in there that he assumes responsibility. Then appoint safety personnel in writing with the authority to execute Marine Corps safety management system processes and programs. One of the new things that we've started this year each of the work centers, the work center safety reps, the primary and secondary safety reps, they will be assigned in writing. If when you're watching this video, if you look at the annual uh, risk mitigation plan behind each of the respective sections plan, you will see those designation letters. You will see what they are responsible uh, to do. I would encourage everybody to read the primary and secondary safety representative, read what they're responsible for, and then hold them accountable to that. Iron sharpens iron. More people that hold each other accountable, and if there's certain things they're, you know, they're supposed to be doing and responsible for within the safety management system, the more people that know it, the more people can hold them accountable, and there's a better chance that everything is gonna be done that needs to be done. Okay, if you look at D there, direct the organization to implement and maintain a command safety management system. That's simply the CO's responsibility to make sure that we do it, make sure that we have the policies and the programs, and, and then not just that we have the policy, but we're actually implementing the do part of the Plan, Do, Check, Act. We're actually implementing and doing what the policies say. Then hold all personnel accountable for effective, say, uh, effective system implementation. Okay, this holding people accountable to do what the order says. Uh, this is just what we do in an organization like ours. Uh, we shouldn't do it just because the order says so. We should be incorporating the safety management system uh, because our fingers and toes, they depend on it. Our eyesight, our hearing depend on it. And it really has, 
as much to do with the people that we live with and the people that are important to us, you can read that in the commanding officer's cover letter. When we get injured at work, if there's something that happens here at the work site, that has a direct impact on a lot more people than just those uh, that, that we work with here in our work centers. And so we need to be cognizant that the safety management system, yes, it's to ensure force readiness and make sure that we have everything that we need here at the airport to succeed in our mission, but it also means that, that people get to go home. When you get out of the Marine Corps, when you retire, when you EAS, it means that you are leaving the Marine Corps with everything you know, potentially even better than it was when you came in. There's absolutely no reason for workplace injuries. And this hold all personnel accountable for effective system implementation. Then if you look at F there, identify reporting requirements up and down the chain of command. We're not gonna go into all of this and provide uh, measures of effectiveness for the performance. A lot of this uh, up and down the chain of command, it simply means that there's gonna be checklists. Headquarters Marine Corps, uh, the IG process, the CGI process, there is gonna be checklists. They are gonna come. We are gonna do self-assessments using that checklist. And, and you know we report uh, up the chain of command when a CGI comes. Uh, so, so none of the, the processes from an inspection perspective are gonna change, okay? If you look at G there, ensure the safety management system and overall safety performance is included in military and civilian performance plans, performance appraisals, compensation, rewards, and recognition. I don't exactly know how this is going to get worked out, especially when, when we deal with uh, uh, you know, compensation, you know, at least on the military side. On the civilian side, we already have safety included in our performance plans and our performance appraisals. Uh, that has been a VPP requirement. We still have here at McCaff an active policy letter that requires these elements to be in, um, the, you know, the, uh, at least on the civilian side. How it's going to work on the military side, uh, you know, this is a brand new order. And maybe there may be some new things coming. Uh, I just don't know. Uh, so if you look at the very first pillar, um, it kind of combines uh, the plan portion. Remember the Plan, Do, Check, Act. It kind of combines the planning, uh, which OSHA requires, with the management, leadership, and employee involvement. Um, and so right there, by blending those two, the Marine Corps has come up with the first pillar uh, of the Marine Corps safety management system. And so if you look at the second pillar, it's risk management. Now, risk management, we're not going to go into great detail today. That's going to be a different period of instruction. But there is, there does seem to be a shift in the Marine Corps where, where leadership is really starting to ensure that risk management principles are applied as much off duty as they are on. And it says Marines plan and conduct operations and training on a daily basis. How Marines plan, operate and train is a reflection of a unit's leadership, culture, training and commitment to the Marine Corps safety management system. It is critical to both mission accomplishment and the preservation of our Marines and assigned equipment that risk management principles and processes are incorporated into all levels of planning, transition, execution, and decision-making, all the way down to the individual. Okay, this is new. Used to, it was a program thing. It was something that the risk management uh, program manager, which is me, uh, you know, risk management was something that from a formal perspective, um, it was something that the Marine Corps, they, you know, now they're specifically saying it goes all the way down to the individual level. So before maybe we would do our risk management training uh, in a way where we just got the check in the box. We need to figure out a way here at McCaff where risk management training um, goes beyond something as simple as taking a Marine Net class and turning in a certificate, but it doesn't change uh, potential risky behavior. Um, again, I don't think a lot has to change here at the air facility. We've got JHAs, we've got tech manuals, we've got our off-duty risk worksheets that, that everybody's working on. We've got our risk, you know, our, our annual risk mitigation plan. There's tons of stuff that comes out of my office. We're going to start producing more of these videos. When you take all of that together, as long as everybody just gets involved, reporting near misses, reporting hazards, reporting first aid cases, all we simply have to do is actually use the policy and the system that's in place and the risk management aspect, we're going to identify 
uh, pretty much everything that could potentially uh, you know, damage equipment or injure an individual. Okay, but they take it all the way down to the individual level here. And then it says risk management will be used to identify and assess hazards and to develop mitigating controls. Okay, here we are in risk management. Now, does that sound like VPP? You got the second and third element kind of blended together here. We've got the, you know, involve them. Obviously, that was element one. Then we've got find them, which is let's identify all the risk. But it says right here that risk management, we also not only assess the hazards, but just like in, you know, in, in, in you know, VPP, we have to develop mitigating controls. Those mitigating controls, again, if you've taken the 10 or 30 hour or if you've studied some of the VPP stuff, this is where we have the hierarchy of controls, uh, where the very last little bit, uh, the very last line of defense is our PPE. Um, implemented control measures uh, are then continuously monitored and analyzed to assess their effectiveness. Well, how do we do that? Well, we simply do that by looking at the areas where first aid cases and, and, and near misses, and if people are injured, we look at what controls were put in place when I do the trend analysis at the end of the year. We evaluate how everybody got hurt. We look what controls were in place. If there were no controls, then we need to identify a way to put controls in. But if there were controls in there, then what we simply do is we try to evaluate where did that control measure fail? And this is that whole constant plan, do, check, act. There was a plan. Uh, you, you did something. Maybe you got injured. Maybe the plan now needs to be tweaked. Okay, later on, we're going to talk about the act part. But the act is simply coming up with goals, coming up with some type of resolution. And what do we do with that resolution? We put that back up in the plan. Okay, we modify the plan. We should never have an order that sits there when the order is wrong. The order needs to be changed. It needs to be updated. We like to live uh, to a degree, at least in the Marine Corps, we may not like it, but we've agreed to live by regulations. The problem is so many regulations, we, we go outside the left or right lateral limits because sometimes the orders, they just don't make sense, or sometimes they're actually impossible uh, to comply with. In the world of safety, we, we, we don't need to make things harder, but we do need to make sure that they're understandable. But more, and more importantly, we need to identify those areas where the control of the risk, it's just not effective. And if it's not, then, you know, we change small dog to puppy and, and we move on and we completely rewrite it. Uh, or, you know, it just however we make that risk just a little bit more manageable. And that's what this is talking about. If you look at their paragraph one, uh, you know, under requirements, it says all levels of Marine Corps leadership must establish risk management procedures. And we have very, very good risk management procedures here at the air facility. So I don't see a whole lot changing here. Okay. Supported by appropriate training and resources in order to identify hazards and manage risk both on and off duty. And then it goes into uh, the different requirements uh, that Marine Corps leadership uh, here in the unit has to uh, ensure happen. So prioritizing the identification and communication of hazards uh, throughout the unit. Uh, and then, you know, and the community of interest. Do we do this? Absolutely. This is one of the reasons why we do JHAs and why we put them in the risk mitigation plan. JHAs, job hazard analysis, for anybody that's new and you haven't quite seen them, what you need to do is open up your risk mitigation plan and take a look at the documents. Uh, they're, they're called JHAs. They're in the back. And, and you know, if, if you're in, in uh, fuels, uh, maybe there's one on taking fuel samples. Maybe there's one for ARF on doing the, uh, the practice fires um, you know, or, or doing bunker gear you know, drills. Maybe if, if you're in groundskeeping, maybe there's a JHA on, on just different aspects of, of grounds maintenance. And a JHA simply looks for those hazards and then it identifies the controls that need to be put in place to manage those hazards. And when we talk about managing hazards, um, I think maybe a, a better way to say it is, is we need to figure out how we can limit our exposure to those things that can cause bodily harm, uh, injury, or illness. And so prioritize the identification there, A, uh, and, and of hazards throughout the unit uh, and communities of interest. B, establish a risk, man you know, risk management 
evaluation policy for subordinate commands. We don't have any subordinate commands, but we do, you know, we will need to have some type of evaluation policy internally. Uh, complete risk assessments as part of the decision making process. Uh, we absolutely do that. Prioritize hazards based on probability and severity. Now I am going to come out of you know out of you know out of the safety department. I do believe over the next several months uh, we are going to come up. Uh, got a few ideas in mind, some pretty creative ways um, that that should be relatively enjoyable. Uh, that that help us understand maybe a little bit better what the Marine Corps is talking about as far as the probability and severity. Uh, e it says tailor risk management training to unit and group training operations and exercises. I like the word tailor, tailor risk management. There's nothing worse than going to training. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and it would make absolutely no sense for ARF to sit through fuels bits training. Uh, maybe some of it would apply, but, but ARF is very different than ATC. ATC is very different than the admin section. Logistics and fuels, they're not going to operate uh, the, the same way that, that, you know, ATC maintenance or, you know, AT, you get what I'm saying. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to tailor the risk management, and risk mitigation strategies based on your work site, based on the tasks that the Marine Corps pays you to do. So tailor risk management training uh, and, and that's going to be something we're going to have to, you know, open it up for suggestions and ideas uh, to see just how we can do that to where it's enjoyable. Then review evaluations for gaps and best practices. Uh, when it talks about review evaluations, you know, the first thing it says there for gaps. When it's talking about gaps, it's talking about those areas where maybe we've looked and we, we, you know, we didn't know there was a problem someplace. Um, and then for best practices, when you review something, we find out this worked really well. And when we find those gaps, we share those with other units. When we find those areas that do really well, uh, we should also share those with other units. Um, you know, and it says, yeah, and that's what it says right there. Share the results with higher headquarters so this information can be disseminated to communities of interest. What the Marine Corps is really trying to do with the safety program is make sure that each unit uh, doesn't just live in their own little stovepipe. You can have one unit that's absolutely horrible in the area of safety but then somebody just a mile down the road, they're doing really well because they've got some good products. Um, we need to get away from uh, the one size fits all, but one of the things we also need to do is make sure when we find something that works, we need to share that around. If you look down at G, develop and implement a change management strategy to minimize the introduction of new hazards and risks into the environment. Uh, you can finish reading that. What this is talking about, is, and this doesn't happen very often, but sometimes things do change. I think probably the largest change here at McCaff over the last several years, there's been two of them and they've all been in the same work center. If you think of ARF, used to they were the silver gear, but now they were bunker gear. Okay, that was a change. Prior to that change, there needed to be some type of change management strategy to identify the controls that were put in place with the silver gear, because they're changing gear, will those controls still work or what needs to shift? The second one was also with ARF with the P-19R, bringing in a new firefighting apparatus, bringing in new, uh, new equipment. Uh, it's got different knobs, different, different functions, different control mechanisms. And so th with the learning curve, uh, that comes along with getting a new vehicle, uh, there needed to be some type of change management strategy. Now here at McCaff, we don't have a written change management strategy and maybe we should. That's probably something I'm gonna work on here in the near future. But just realize in your work center, an effective risk management program means that when we have something that changes, when there's a process that changes, we can't just accept that process without looking to make sure we have everything in place that we need to have so when that new process is implemented all the hazards or at least most of them the ones that we can identify have been identified and we've got the appropriate control measures uh, in place and again we go back to the hierarchy of controls can we engineer it out there may be some administrative things that need to happen to have some type of administrative controls um, Maybe we can figure out a better way to do it so we can completely eliminate the hazard to begin with. And if all of those 
uh, you know, if, if there's still hazards that exist after everything in um, the hierarchy of controls has been tried and implemented, there may be some new PPE that we have to resource and, and get funding for if it can't be internally funded. All of those things have to take place uh, as far as a change management strategy. We're not going to go into the principles of risk management. Principles of risk management, they're the same. Those did not change. If you look at three, you know, risk is characterized uh, by probability and severity. Okay, That hasn't changed either. Okay, we're going to get into this a little bit more when we when we expand on uh, the risk management training. Uh, if you keep looking at the order, uh, controls uh, should include the methodology uh, for monitoring and tracking their effectiveness. Okay, that's one of the things we don't do much of. We just have controls in place, and we assume that if nobody is injured, that the controls work. Where this is where. I think at McCaff, we do better than anybody else in the Marine Corps uh, with our near miss program because a control can be in place, but you may see something that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up and something's not quite right. Well, this may be the opportunity to report a near miss. And then we look at those near misses and we evaluate, okay, there's already a control in place, but we're having a consistent stream of near misses on this one thing. Uh, so maybe it's time to reevaluate that control. Then if you look at five, all risk decisions uh, must be made at the appropriate level in the chain of command. When we get into risk management training, they've actually done a pretty good job in the order of defining who has that level of authority based on uh, the activity. Then, you know, six is kind of a no-brainer. It says risk management does not alleviate the inherent responsibility to comply with local, state, national, or host nation laws, regulations, and rules. Okay, no kidding. Okay, so again, risk management, um, like I said earlier in, uh, you know, Marine Corps Order MCO 5100.29 Charlie, uh, the four pillars are defined in Volume 1, Chapter 1. Volume 2 of the order, um, that is the risk management chapter. And we are gonna get into that uh, here in the very near future where we kind of roll out maybe a little bit more robust risk management program. It goes far beyond just the simple training and turning in your training completion uh, roster. Let's look at pillar number three, safety assurance. This is a little bit different. If we think of the three elements of VPP, uh, involve them, find them, fix them, uh, those, you know, this safety assurance you can see there is the evaluation and review and monitoring that assures commanders the elements of the Marine Corps safety management system are being implemented and guides continuous process improvement efforts. One of the things you may not know, and I think I briefly mentioned earlier, this year, the 2020 goals, those were identified because there were areas or the 2021 goals those were established and the commander agreed uh, based on, on factual data that these things need to take place because we found a shortfall in one of our processes. That's exactly what it's talking about here. It does say headquarters command must also monitor their internal and external data needs uh, to trend analysis, identify hazards, measure effectiveness of risk controls. So this is basically saying, when you do this, evaluate what you do. And then when, and this goes back into that plan, do, check, act. We don't just have the plan, we execute the plan. But then when we execute the plan is the outcome, what we wanted the outcome to be. Did we reach the end state where we wanted to? Um, if we didn't or something went wrong, then that's when uh, we need to do a needs assessment. We need to do some type of trend analysis and figure out, okay, what happened? Where did it go wrong? And then again, what type of controls need to be put in place? Okay, command should use existing data streams and reports wherever possible. Um, that's simply talking about, use the information that's out there. I get tons of near misses. In 2000 and, uh, uh, 2020, last year, um, we hit 500 near miss reports. Now, if everybody was doing what they were supposed to by the order, we should be well over a thousand. But holy smokes, in 2019, I think we had 27 near miss reports. We went from 27 to 500. I want you to think about the volume of information that's available in them. Now, some of them were kind of corny and some people 
um, you know, use near miss as an opportunity to, to practice their stand-up comedy. Okay, but the heart behind it is to, to live really those, those nine benefits that we have with our near miss program. And this is one of the things that it's talking about. When it talks about an evaluation process, the near miss is one of those data streams that's just absolutely um, invaluable. Same thing with flash reports. Um, you know, we, we get valuable information from the flash reports. We also get valuable information, uh, you know, unfortunately, even from mishaps. So when I do a mishap investigation and we try to figure out what happened and why it happened and we look at some, maybe some of the human conditions, um, these are all of the data streams that this pillar, safety assurance, um, this has to be in play. We can't just do stuff for the sake of doing stuff in the safety world without having some form of assurance or some type of trend analysis that shows us, are we doing it the way we're supposed to, okay? That says right there, you can see, identify potential hazards and confirm risks during inspections, okay? We certainly do that. Um, assessments and evaluations. During the inspections, assessments and evaluation. Okay, the process focuses on compliance and conformance uh, with Marine Corps safety management systems and performance results achieved. Okay, so, you know, again, this, like I said earlier, I don't think we're going to have to change a whole lot. I am hoping that the shift in this, when people recognize that it's not just, it's no longer installations that have to have some form of safety management system. You know, even HMX, down at HMX, they're going through growing pains. Uh, how do they incorporate the Marine Corps safety management system? It's no longer a safety program that they can kind of get away with uh, and just have a, a CJ. Now there's an actual process. We understand that process. We understand it because we are a VPP star site and we have gone through that process. Okay, so the rest of the Marine Corps is going to have to do this. Okay. You're going to be there, develop and implement a strategy to minimize the introduction of new hazards uh, and risks in the work environment. I, I think that's a no-brainer. We, we do that as well. Again, like I said, I'm not going to read this entire order to you. Um, you know, there's a couple on here. I mean, look at C, identify and manage risk caused by changes. We've already talked about that a little bit. Ensure corrective actions are taken when non-conformance, I like that, with safety management system processes is identify. Ensure corrective action is taken when non-conformance, which means what? Remember, one of the four categories of VPP, uh, or not VPP, but our near-miss reporting system, one of those categories is, is, is reporting what? When somebody doesn't follow an established process or a procedure. So when there's non-conformance, when somebody's not doing it, okay, at all levels of leadership, uh, there needs to be some type of corrective action to get everybody back on the same page, okay? E says establish, maintain, and monitor an anonymous reporting and feedback system, okay? We have that here at the Air Facility. Now listen, and this is just kind of a shameless plug for the AnyMouse program. That's for safety-related items. I still want to encourage everybody that is watching this video, you, you have every right, you have every right to voice concerns um, when it comes to your health and safety or the health and safety of everybody that you work with and, and around. Uh, I would encourage, before you submit an any mouse, shoot me an email, send me a text, give me a call, come over to my office, let's share a cup of coffee. Okay, well, we won't share it, but you can have yours, I'll have mine. We need to get to a place where there's that open dialogue. We're going to talk about that here in, in just a minute. But we need to continue working on a culture where we're if we are dissatisfied when it comes to the area of safety, okay, not saying that work is hard, okay, we're not, we're, we're not, we're not turning the anonymous mishap reporting or the anonymous hazard reporting, we're not turning that into a gripe session, but everybody does need to know that there is a system in place when you've gone through your chain of command, you've gone through uh, everything you can think of doing, there is still very similar, um, you know, processes are out in town uh, in, in the civilian world, but, but you need to realize that my office is open. I am your advocate, um, but, but when, when, when push comes to shove and you just don't see things being uh, addressed and you truly believe somebody can be injured, uh, this isn't a time to poke at the safety program, poke at the CO, poke because there's personality differences. Uh, the anonymous hazard reporting 
is truly to bring up things to the commanding officer uh, the, the, that just need that level of attention. Okay, enough on that. Let, let's not abuse the AnyMouse program, uh, but, but let's make sure everybody understands uh, that it is an extremely valuable tool when used correctly. All right, let's see. Ensure recommendations developed from acquired data are actionable and adequately measure safety management system performance. Okay, that kind of goes along with some of the goals. Uh, the recommendations, are we actually developing, um, you know, goals? Uh, are we just throwing, you know, stuff on the wall and seeing what sticks? Or are we developing those goals based on actual facts? Listen, the goals that come out of the safety office, uh, some of them actually, you know, they're, they're good ideas. But if you look back over time, we are where we're at today uh, with our world-class safety program for the simple fact that we have established goals over the last you know four five six years we've gone through this goal process uh the rest of the marine corps is going to have to jump on board they're going to have to figure out what it's like to come up with january safety goals um and and then work towards them um and then at the end of the year just like we're doing this year in our self-assessment this year that we owe uh the vpp region three that's our uh that's the region we're in if you didn't know for vpp we have to do for osha a self-assessment and in that self-assessment, we actually have to discuss the 2020 goals. What ones did we make? What ones didn't we make? Why didn't we reach some of our goals? Uh, maybe some of the goals didn't come out with the same uh, or the expectation. They didn't come out with the, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? They didn't, they, they didn't produce. Uh, or maybe we didn't come up with, uh, we just didn't get to the end game where we thought we would. Well, then we have to say why. And we've got to go back and look at data and say, okay, what's, well, you know, what was, was the data wrong? And, and we, just, we just do a whole analysis of where did the goals come from? Did we meet the goal? Why didn't we meet the goal? And is it a goal that's worth pursuing? Uh, this year, we, we met our goal, but just barely with the OSHA 10 hour class. We still have several people that have been here for, for quite a while uh, that haven't been able to take it. And most of that was because of, of COVID-19 and then the student restrictions that I was under uh, by not putting as many people as we used to in our classroom. Okay, very easily uh, explainable. It's something that we can explain. But if you look at the 2021 goals, uh, this year we've gone from 80% completion by the end of December of this year uh, to 90%. Now you wouldn't think 10% would be that much, but who knows? You know, I'm hoping there's not another pandemic in 2021, but you never know what's gonna happen. So we simply establish goals that we think we can meet, but if we don't meet them, we have to explain why and then adjust our program uh, accordingly. Um, monitor the status. If you look at, at G there, uh, monitor the status of corrective and preventative actions, injuries, uh, illness matrix, and, and findings of accident investigations, including uh, hazard, look at that, and near miss reports. Um, everybody needs to understand you guys are doing a fantastic job uh, with near miss reporting. We are the only, as far as I know, the only unit in the Marine Corps that has this aggressive uh, of, of a near miss reporting program. Uh, but I can promise you, there's a whole lot of people that are watching our near miss reporting program because it has been identified as a phenomenal practice. This year, we identified a lot of different trends. And it's a whole lot easier to affect change when all we're looking at is near misses. I would much rather do it then than, you know, when a near miss turns into an accident, uh, you know, or worse, a fatality. Uh, investigate mishaps, near misses, hazards, and instances of potential regulatory noncompliance. Okay, and then share results with pertinent stakeholders. Okay, this is important. Okay, we've got to investigate these things. When I come and do an investigation, it is not a, 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 a punitive style of investigation. A safety investigation, I'm coming to find out what part of the control broke down. So keep that in mind. And you need to be open with me. If it's a personality issue, if it's a non-compliance issue, it could be something as simple as somebody just thinks safety is stupid. Okay? These are good things for me to learn because then I need to get smart on how do we implement controls in those types of situations that are actually effective. Okay? The plan, do, check, act, that is a cycle. As soon as you act, it goes back up to the plan. And it's not once you get down to the act, you're done. Then you have to evaluate once you've modified your plan, you, you execute the new plan. 
Uh, you evaluate that new plan and then you act. That's exactly what, what, what I is talking about here. Ensure continuous improvement. Continuous improvement strategies that commanders identify deficiencies, define and implement fixes and measure results to ensure the deficiency has been corrected. The safety management system supports continuous process improvement by creating a framework to review safety conformance and performance. It refines and improves suboptimal uh, elements as trends develop by applying timely interventions. Uh, leaderships at all level, okay, you can see there it gets into the PDCA uh, you know, cycle. Uh, this is what I do in the safety office. This is where the goals come from. This is where every January uh, OICs are rewriting uh, or maybe even writing for the first time their risk mitigation plan. The CO safety policy, it is something that gets stuck on the wall when, when, when we get a new commanding officer. Uh, but if you look in the front cover of every risk mitigation plan, you've got the commander's guidance for the upcoming year. Um, there's absolutely no way the, in the beginning of 2020, the, the, the commanding officer would have ever known that we were getting ready to enter into a pandemic. And so his safety policy doesn't say anything about that, okay? But being given the opportunity uh, with an effective safety management system by, by, by rewriting the CO safety policy uh, at the beginning of the year, now we can, you know, the commanding officer can, can incorporate uh, maybe some of the COVID response and lessons learned to uh, 2021, okay? All right, well, let's keep going real quick. Uh, let's talk about safety assurance. Um, uh, not safety assurance, safety promotion and training. Uh, safety promotion and training. Remember the four elements of VPP. Uh, the last one is safety and health training. Headquarters Marine Corps, uh, and I really like this, they not only uh, talk about training here, but they also talk about promotion. And, and, and safety promotion isn't just about getting the information out there and promoting safety. They also include their safety awards program. We already have one of the one of the most effective safety training programs out there in the Marine Corps, so not much is going to change in that. We're going to continue to produce videos like this. Uh, we're going to continue to do the OSHA 10 and 30 hour. We're going to continue with our annual training and the little booklets. Uh, yes, I know they're a little bit harder. Um, don't forget, you have 30 days for each of those, uh, at least the training that comes out of my office. Uh, but I want you to just very, very briefly, and we're almost done here, I want you to look at item number one there. Uh, the fourth pillar uh, for the Marine Corps Safety Management System is safety promotion and training. And item one down there, the promotion, uh, safety promotion increases awareness of the Marine Corps Safety Management System objectives and benefits to members of the command. This is simply where we communicate. This is, you can read a little bit further down, uh, this communication promotes transparency uh, and a shared understanding of command priorities and goals. Um, and then you can go down there, uh, you know, the very last part of that, you know, says this element must also include processes for two-way communication up and down the chain of command. Uh, I want you to look at A and B there, all personnel, okay? This, all, this means you civilian employees too. You may be here a while, you may think nothing needs to change. Well, you do. This applies to military and civilian as well. And so just because you wear... Uh, to include me, just because we wear civilian clothes uh, to come to work, and we may work side by side with with uniform wearing individuals, but the order is very clear that all personnel shall know the Marine Corps safety management system requirements that apply to their individual duties and responsibilities. So you don't have to know the whole thing, but you do need to know those things that are at least within your lane. If you look down, B is when it talks about awards. It doesn't go into the specific. There is a chapter five uh, of volume one that gets into uh, specific awards. But what I like about this is it talks about timely recognition for personnel uh, for their contribution to an effective safety management system is critical. We have that with the on the spot award. Our VPP passport is actually part of the awards program uh, because when you complete your VPP passport, uh, you should be getting the certificate from the commanding officer. You get the, the coin, uh, but what everybody likes is the 272s, okay? Then it goes into training, um, you know, both formal and informal training. We're not going to, I mean, this, the, we beat this horse all the time. Training is important, and I'm doing the very best I can to make sure that safety training, uh, I'm, I'm done with the days where people say this is too hard. Uh, don't be offended when I say this. I don't care. I do want to respect your time. I want to make sure that that what I am presenting to you 
Uh, there's value in it, but you have to realize that safety training when done wrong, okay, that lack of information or the information that was just poor, um, individual goes out to a work site and they've got poor information or wrong information or bad information or they weren't taught the right way to do something, that can lead to an injury. And going back to how we started this, remember an injury at work, it just doesn't affect those people that you work with. It also affects those people that are home, um, the people that, that, that we care for and, and the people that care for us. Um, you can finish reading this uh, at, at your leisure. Um, if you look at number three, and we're not gonna get into this uh, very much, but if you look at safety culture, I want you to very briefly look an informed safety culture is composed of four culture types. And I like this, and here in a minute, I'm gonna put up a figure that, that I'm gonna show you. Um, but it says here, let's finish with the order first. It says that should be continuously promoted and reinforced through leadership actions throughout the organization. Now look at this, so the first one, you've got a just culture. Okay, we're gonna talk about that briefly here in a second. Then you've got a reporting culture, a learning culture, and, and boy, here's a tough one, a flexible culture. Now, when we think of a just culture, and we're not gonna go into great length with these, you can read the order, uh, but I truly believe we have this culture here at the air facility. If you look at a just culture, look here, this is figure 1.2 out of the order. It says a just culture encourages personnel to report unsafe or unhealthy working conditions without fear of reprisal or adverse actions. Commanders, commanding officers, officers in charge and civilian equivalents must encourage reporting for safety analysis and mishap prevention purposes while establishing clear guidelines on acceptable and unacceptable behavior. In a just culture, the immediate response by personnel who become aware of a hazard should be to find what happened and why versus who to blame and punish. A just culture fart, uh, uh, fosters partnership uh, and builds trust between leaders and those led and encourages the identification of hazards and the causes of mishaps. This is absolutely what we do. One of the greatest things is the report a hazard feature on the app uh, or the mobile safety web. Uh, we've got the near miss. Um, you know, we've got so many different reporting tools and, and, and you guys do fantastic. I, I would love to see some of the work centers kind of elevate their game just a little bit. But as a whole, I do believe we have a just culture. We don't have a problem. Nobody is going to get in trouble for using the, you know, the Arrive Live program. Nobody is going to get in trouble for reporting a hazard. Nobody's going to get in trouble for submitting near misses. Where we may have questions, though, is if there's a near miss or there's an accident or there's a hazard and people knew about it, but nobody said anything. I haven't seen that here at McCaff in, in years. I think we do a great job, but we do need to continually, just as this, um, you know, j just as this element said, we do need to make sure that that this we continue to beat this drum. We get new people all the time. We get new people that don't come from VPP sites, and so they have no idea about the near miss reporting system. We need to make sure, especially you leaders, we need to make sure that everybody all the way down to the individual that checked in yesterday understands that this is part of a just culture and they have a voice uh, to make sure that if they see something uh, that isn't quite right, if it's a hazard, if it's a near miss, that, that they have every right uh, to report that, okay? Then that kind of goes along uh, with the second culture type of, of reporting. A reporting culture promotes the importance of voluntary reporting of hazards and errors in order to improve operational readiness, reduce mishap frequency and severity, and to prevent reoccurrences, okay? This is one of the things when we trend things out, when we recognize there's a lot of different things that we find in the near miss program, we don't just let them. Now, I, I understand there's a lot of things that don't get fixed quickly around here, and that's really nobody's fault. That's just the, the, the process and the system. It's just slow but we shouldn't allow the hazard to go completely unchecked. There's got to be some type of interim risk control that we can put into place. So if you see a hazard, if you see something and it's been there for a long time, one, we need to make sure the right people know about it, um, meaning S4. Don't just submit a hazard, don't just submit a near miss report and think magically S4 is gonna get these things. That's not how this works, okay? They're the ones that control uh, when and what gets fixed. Um, and you know, I, I stick my nose or my thumb in it when when there, when it's a safety issue, uh, and and I'll throw my two cents in, and everybody gives the commanding officer the uh, the information and and, and advisement. 
Um, and then and then leadership, because remember, the buck stops with them. They have ultimate responsibility over the Marine Corps safety management system. And, and so they are going to evaluate what has the most risk and they're going to make the, the best risk decision uh, that they can. Okay, so let's take a look at the next uh, the next culture, the learning culture. Uh, you can see uh, the third component of an informed culture. Uh, learning culture should be continuously promoted and reinforced by leadership actions throughout the Marine Corps by showing a willingness to apply lessons learned and change procedures. You know, one of the things that we don't like to do very often is, is, is we simply don't, um, we don't like change. We, we don't like change. We don't like new things. We don't like, uh, you know, when we get into a rhythm, when we get into a routine, when we get into something that we're comfortable with, most of the time we simply don't like to change um, just for the sake of that. Uh, but in, in the world of safety, we have to be willing to, to change. We have to be able to, to look at our surroundings, maybe look at some lessons learned, maybe look at things that we didn't do as well as we thought we would. If we go back to the plan, do, check, act, you know, when, when, when you look at that cycle, you know, the plan, do, check, act, the, the do doesn't always turn out to be what the original plan is. And a learning culture is going to look at that. A learning culture, when they check the difference between the plan and the do, what they hoped they would accomplish compared to what they did. If they hope to have no injuries or no mishaps, but they did, the check part needs to be a willingness to learn from those mistakes, a willingness to change procedures, as this said. You know, we've talked about, you know, a just and a reporting culture. Um, it, it does no good if, if we have a just culture and everybody is, is, is free um, and, and understands the need to report and, and you know, without fear of reprisal. We, we need to have a culture where reporting is open and, and honest and people say what they see, uh, just like we do with our near misses and hazards and, and, and all of that. But if we don't learn from it, uh, then what's all that for? One of the biggest pushbacks that we had when I when 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 we came up and rolled out uh, the near miss reporting program, uh, one of the biggest concerns was we were simply just going to push out a whole lot of data, but then nothing is ever really returned. Nothing comes back from it. That's why it's so important for me to make sure that I do exactly what our air facility order says with near misses and provide that quarterly trend analysis. If people would look at that quarterly trend analysis and just spend a little bit of time studying, um, that's your information. That's the information that you are sending me, and I'm putting it together in a much bigger format, maybe a higher elevation uh, format, the 50,000 foot view down, and, and, and we're looking at the trends overall. Um, now, if we can't learn from those trends, then honestly, having a just culture and having a, a culture that, that understands the importance of reporting, it, it accomplishes nothing. And so a learning culture, I believe here, uh, we, we do it well. We need to be able to learn. You can see there on the chart, the very last thing that it says, uh, a learning culture requires a willingness to communicate lessons learned as well as change procedures and practices based on known hazards and errors before a mishap results. That's the whole purpose of an effective near miss reporting program. We've got the four categories that we report in. You know, a near miss used to be defined, um, and hopefully the Marine Corps continues down this road and they continue to want to redefine what a near miss is. Uh, but if you've ever watched the near miss video that the McCaff NCOs put together, uh, a near miss was an almost accident. The trains left the station. There's, there's no bringing it back. Uh, the trigger's been pulled. The near miss means an accident. Um, the dynamics of that accident, the only thing that kept it from becoming an accident was a matter of inches or seconds. Okay, what we need to get to the place of doing is making sure that we're reporting the hazard, reporting near misses from our four categories before the dynamics of an accident ever even get launched. That makes it tough because we don't know if anything that we're doing is effective. But I can tell you 
for several years in a row now, our mishap rate continues to go down. It's getting tough to get much lower than we are, but little by little, it seems like uh, what we are doing is having an effect. I would much rather do aggressive reporting and not have any injuries or you know, you know few injuries than have no reporting and watch our mishap rate go up. I do believe, and so does OSHA, that, that an effective, aggressive, uh, near-miss first aid hazard and mishap reporting program are, are keys to uh, looking at the things that have happened. If you've seen the trend reports, if you look at the, uh, the annual trend analysis from this year, I wrote a, a relatively long article the last couple of months on leading and lagging indicators. Okay, Not just looking at the things that happened in the past, but learning from them, and that's what this pillar uh, or this this culture type of the third pillar is uh, or, or the fourth pillar rather um, we, we've got to be able to change we've got to be able to analyze what we've done wrong and then be willing uh, to to adjust from that okay very quickly let's talk about the last one um, a flexible culture a flexible culture empowers personnel to recommend procedural and behavioral changes within the organization we do this really well here you know, a lot of people say I'm creative and, and there's a lot of good things uh, that, that we have done over the years as far as the safety program goes. But to be honest, probably half of the things that we've put into place or we've made adjustments on, a lot of those were simply the, the atmosphere that we have with an effective safety program is people coming to my office or talking to me in a class saying, hey, I've got this idea, I've got that idea. If you've noticed in the VPP passport, one of the things that's in there is providing the safety office suggestions for this continuous improvement cycle that, that I've continued to, to kind of hit on uh, during this. The Marine Corps is going to this in a much more aggressive fashion. The Plan, Do, Check, Act, uh, that has been incorporated into the four elements of VPP. When you combine the two, that's how we get our four pillars. So just very quickly, as a recap, you can see uh, the four culture types. You've got a just culture, a uh, reporting culture, a learning culture, and a flexible culture. And then the last slide I have for you here, again, these pillars, it does say in the order that you need to know these. And so as a recap, the four pillars of the new Marine Corps safety management system, you've got policy and leadership as pillar one. You've got risk management as pillar two, and there will be more that come out about pillar two here in the near future. You've got safety assurance, which is pillar three, and that's when, remember, we're getting more into the programmatics and what system do we have in place to make assurances that we are doing what we are supposed to do. And then safety promotion, key takeaway there is at all levels, of leadership and every individual, we need to be constantly promoting safety, not just from a document or training perspective, but also leadership needs to display that. Young Marines need to see leadership displaying uh, safety promotion. Um, and, and then again, the Marine Corps has worked into the safety promotion, uh, the awards process. We've got a good on, on the spot awards process here. Um, I would like to give a lot more stuff out. So just put a plug in for that. And then obviously, you know, the fourth pillar, safety promotion and training. Um, that's all I have for this period of instruction. Again, this whole uh, dynamic of the four pillars, this is probably the first product that I've put out. Uh, to teach the four pillars, you need to know them because the rest of the Marine Corps safety management system, uh, the rest of the volumes in the, in the Marine Corps order, they all revolve around supporting uh, each of these four principles as well as uh, the, the culture types that we've talked about. Like I said in the very beginning, I don't think we're going to have to change a whole lot. We've got a solid safety program, uh, but at this point, the Marine Corps, uh, because the order is signed, um, I'm glad we're a VPP site now uh, because you know we've already made that change. We already have the culture, and we have that because of your willingness to buy in to the importance that you are responsible uh, for your safety. Let's continue doing the right thing. 
just like I've told so many of you when you checked in, I don't think I've ever told anybody to go out and be safe because you can be doing the wrong thing safely, but it's still the wrong thing. Let's go out and do the right thing. Learn more about this order. I would encourage everybody to uh, continue with your workbooks. Uh, there's going to be more of these come out. Again, I'm looking for ideas on better ways to conduct this training. I uh, didn't want death by PowerPoint. Don't know how many more of these videos I'm going to make, but if this is, uh, if there is value added and this was a better way to do it, uh, I would certainly uh, welcome your feedback. Again, if you've got questions, you know where my office is. I'm over on the first deck in building 2100, um, uh, room 114. And if you have questions or you just have comments, uh, by all means, drop me an email uh, or swing by the office and see me.